going to get going. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today as we continue Beyond Brave Spaces. Today is our session number four, an imperative addressing barriers and growing diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM to advance innovation and solutions. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll hear from our panelists here in just a moment. My name is Nicole DeWillier Fenton. I'm in our continuing and distance education department and I'm joined by Dr. Wanda Heading Grant the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of Vermont, and we'll hear from Dr. Heading Grant in just a few moments. Before we get started, I just wanted to give a brief land acknowledgement. UVM is located on the land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples for thousands of years and is the home to Western Abnaki people. UVM honors, recognizes, and respects these peoples, especially the Abnaki, as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we gather today. In that spirit, today we will begin by acknowledging we are guests in this land and we need to respect and help protect the lands within our use. The logistics today, we are welcoming our viewers on YouTube. Please post any questions and comments in the chat. We have an incredible team that will be monitoring those questions and sharing them with our presenters as well. This session is being recorded. If you are not sure if you RSVP'd and you're just joining us on YouTube, please do send us an email to make sure you can get the recording of this session. We are also having live captions for us today to make sure that that information is accessible. We'll have a 45 minute presentation and then plenty of time for question and answer. We are very um, fortunate to have not only Dr. Rwanda Heading Grant, but our president, President Suresh Garamella joining us. And I'm going to toss it over to Dr. Heading Grant in just a moment to introduce President Garamella. But just making note, President Garamella is going to be joining us at the beginning of the presentation and then stepping out. So we look forward to hearing his comments and then we'll continue with the presentation. I'm going to now toss it over to the visionary for this series, Dr. Wanda Heading Grant. Wow, thank you so much, Nicole. So glad to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. I bring you greetings from Burlington, Vermont, here at the University of Vermont's campus. We're having a wonderful time. It's a beautiful day out here, and I'm excited that I have Dr. Suresh Garamella, my president, our president here, who will be speaking with us as one of the presenters. I'd like to just share with you, as you've already heard, um, Dr. Suresh Garamella is the president of the University of Vermont. He is a scholar, mechanical engineer, and he sits on the National Science Board which creates strategies to promote the progress of science. He just recently wrote a piece and it's titled, titled, we're, squan squan we're squandering the potential of millions of young people, a failure to nurture students from underrepresented groups who have a talent for science and technology will make America weaker. I am so excited to have him here. I'm so excited for us to dive into some of his thoughts that he has on there. So at this point, President Garamella, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Um, thanks to all of you for putting these lovely uh, events together. I think uh, they have come to be very important to the community. So uh, truly congratulate all of you. Um, so I uh, speak to you all today as a professor of mechanical engineering. Uh, I've been a teacher, a researcher, a mentor for 30 years as a person of color, uh, and as a father of two children, uh, one who's a senior and one who's a sophomore in engineering. So I guess I have a few connections to this community. I also come uh, to share work that I've been engaged in as a member of the National Science Board, as Wanda mentioned. In the slides today, I'll actually liberally be using data and graphics from the work of the National Science Board and the National Science Foundation. Um, I think there'd be little disagreement in this group or in any group that is vital that the U.S. maintain a strong STEM workforce if it is to remain a world leader. A strong STEM workforce is influenced by what happens to our students from early childhood through graduate school. Immigration is a big contributor as well and has been an important source of innovation and entrepreneurship in this country. So if you could move to the next slide. So here's a very uh, 
helpful graphic, I think, where um, it, it, where uh, it, it, we we illustrate the issue that we're talking about today. Um, it, it's uh, it's from the NSB's Vision 2030 report, where it draws attention to what we call the missing millions, those folks who were not successfully engaging in our country. We need to be aggressive about cultivating the fullness of the nation's domestic talent. While participation of women and underrepresented minorities um, has increased slowly in science and engineering over the past few decades, the total SME workforce has grown faster. Progress in creating a diverse and inclusive SME enterprise has not kept pace with demographic trends or with the increasing centrality of science and engineering in our economy, our national security, <laughs> and our jobs of the future. And we therefore miss the chance, I believe, to foster individual opportunity in the thriving economy. Uh, for our SNE workforce to reflect our nation's population by 2030, which, is, which means to close this talent gap, we must accelerate progress in increasing the participation rates of currently underrepresented groups. For the SME workforce to be representative of the U.S. population by 2030, the number of women must double, Black and African Americans must more than double, and Hispanic Latinx people must triple from the 2020 numbers in the U.S. SME workforce, just to meet the population, uh, the, 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 the representation of the population. If you could go to the next slide. So, um, I want to mention uh, this, this op-ed that I wrote. I, I feel fa passionate about this and recently published this op-ed in, uh, in, in Scientific American. You may want to take a look. Uh, I highlighted the importance of mentors and role models in this op-ed, drawing on my own uh, experience and the influence of mentors, starting with my, my parents, who were hardworking and inculcated in me a lot of the uh, the uh, qualities and, and, and characteristics that are needed for success. So in the next slide, uh, I, I list a good number of studies. There's been increasing attention of late to this topic. A study funded by the National Science Foundation and, and Inside Higher Ed, a, a, a publication that we all look at, um, called it an article. Uh, the ar article was called Early Departures. Um, back in February 2019, I believe it was, had important findings about early departures of students of color, as in why they leave, okay? So there was little difference in the percentage of white, black, and Latinx students who opted for STEM majors at the beginning of the students' um, studies, okay? They were all roughly at about 20% of, uh, of, of, of their population. But the black and Latinx students that's the majors at higher rates than the white students. About 37% of the Latinx students and 40% of the black students switched majors versus 29% of the white students. And 20% of Latinx and 26% of black STEM majors left that institution without earning a degree. Only 13% of white STEM majors dropped out. So clearly there are disparities here. Other research studies have helped provide some explanation for these trends. Among them, the top six reasons why students have said that they leave STEM majors, and this is identified from interviews with something like 350 students, was poor quality of STEM teaching. That was 96% of them said that. Difficult transition to college, 89% said that. Competitive, unsupportive, STEM culture was 81%. Low grades in early years was 79%. Inadequate high school preparation in subject and study skills was 64%. And loss of interest in discipline was another. Yet another study looked at why black students pursue careers outside of STEM. And the answer was, and this is interesting, they anticipated discrimination in particular fields. The racial composition of classes, teaching groups, and teaching staff influenced them. Student values and the ability and availability of opportunities to network. So there's so much to process in these data 
and for us to learn from and respond to. And I, I think this is a perfect uh, uh, place to start, and I hope, I hope that conversation will continue. In the next slide, I, uh, I, I, I highlight what minority-serving institutions are doing that we can learn a lot from. There was a recent National Academies report, which is, uh, which is shown on this slide, which pointed out that there are roughly 700 minority-serving institutions in the nation with an established and intentional focus on educating and training students of color. MSIs, I bet if, I, if this was a live session, I'd ask you, what fraction of STEM degrees in the U.S. do you think MSIs produce? It's one-fifth. One-fifth of all STEM degrees in the U.S. are produced by minority-serving institutions. And over half of all MSIs are two-year institutions. So I think these are all very important data for us to get a full picture. The report, as I've listed here, identifies promising strategies to support the long-term success of MSI students in STEM fields. This includes multi-level, mission-driven leadership, institutional responsiveness, supportive campus environments, student-centered support, effective mentoring and sponsorship, undergraduate research experiences, and mutually beneficial partnerships. Not a surprise to many of you, right? And things that some of us at UVM have been trying to do. Uh, and of course, there is the community that MSIs create of others like you, which is a source of great support and confidence. That's, that's my own take. That's not from the report. MSI's most successful initiatives to support students are distinguished by intentionality. All these are one thing, but you have to be intentional about creating these things, creating incentives, initiatives, policies, practices, tailored to meet the students where they are in their college careers academically, financially, and socially, and doing so with a cultural mindfulness that moves students towards higher levels of academic achievement and self-confidence. I think there's a lot we have to learn from MSIs, so I, I hope we will um, uh, we'll continue that. There is much uh, all of us can learn, and I know Dean Shadler is deeply committed to partnering with MSIs, and we're, we're making progress there. The next slide is another reality which we cannot forget, and that is financial considerations. Okay, so just look at the numbers. The 2018 median family incomes had white families had 66,000, black families 42,000, and Hispanic families 51,000. And there was little saving for college possible for at least half of U.S. families. Half of U.S. families could not save for college. Pell Grants, a very important source of support, don't cover even a third of the average cost of attendance. Think of that. And the average student debt is $37,000. While there are many things we need to do, the financial challenges at the core cannot be overlooked. Certainly, it's been my uh, overriding passion to try and get affordability and accessibility into what we think about, and I know all of us are thinking about it. The next slide. Um, is, a, is a pictorial representation of, um, if you were to summarize the NSB 2030 vision and one uh, pictorial, this is it. I'd recommend this document. There's a, there's a link there for you to look at. Um, to take a look, it's a short document, and it tells you where the National Science Board thinks the nation should go. Um, we recommend that NSF and other stakeholders prioritize efforts to deliver social and economic benefits from NSF-funded research, develop a more diverse and multifaceted STEM workforce, expand research infrastructure across the country, in all parts of the country, not just focused in a few places, and foster international research partnerships. These are all part of the four main sort of focus areas in there. The last slide I have, the next one, is about foreign students and the power and importance of immigration. Let's not forget that international students and immigrants have brought so much to our country, I speak with some experience. Um, 
foreign students represent 35% of graduate students in science, engineering, and health fields. In computer science, math, and engineering, over 50% of MS and PhD students are foreign students. We must continue to keep the U.S. attractive for graduate study and immigration. But as the stature and quality of schools overseas increases, as do available jobs overseas, and certainly as visa challenges seem to continue to increase, we must increase domestic participation so that we have a, a workforce that we can count on. So, um, excuse me. So the last slide uh, is simply my closing. I, I come back to this pictorial that shows that there are these missing millions we need to reach. We need to go beyond boutique solutions applicable to a single university or a community college. We need scalable solutions that result in systemic change. Here at UVM, we value the tenets of our common ground, respect, integrity, innovation, openness, justice, and responsibility and contributing to our national imperative to reach the missing millions fits right into those values. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, President Garamella. That was um, a, a lot there, and I just really want to thank you for sharing some of that empirical data. I want to thank you so much for setting us up for some um, important questions that we're going to have to explore. And I'm looking forward to us as we get to the end, when we get into Q&A, how we will begin to explore some of the financial challenges, how are we going to really become intentional and purposeful in terms of um, to, to um, get to those individuals who are missing, the missing millions, that's a lot. And I think that um, when I started this process, I remember putting in a little blurb that says, the, the innovation and the solutions. If we were not missing those millions, you know, what might, we might literally have, a, you know, a vaccine for COVID now. We might, you know, literally be doing a lot, a lot of other things in the society and world that gets us to a place that um, we all can thrive in as um, human beings. So thank you so much for sharing that and um, wish you well for the rest of the day. But we will be exploring what you have put on the table for us. Thank you. We will continue to move forward with our next set of panelists. Um, thank you all for being here. And as we move forward, what I would like to do is ask that you all please tell us your name, if you have a preferred pronoun, and your title and affiliation um, at this particular time. I would like to start with um, Marie. Will you share with us who you are? Hi, I am Marie Worksham Banks. I'm so happy to be here, so excited. Um, I'm currently a senior network engineer at Verizon and I'm a graduate of mechanical engineering at the University of Vermont, 1996. Thank you very much. So glad to have you here. Um, you know I knew you when you were a student, you know. So I can't wait here. Wait to hear you. All right. Dr. Melissa um, Pizzapini, can you share a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm a recently tenured associate professor in the Department of Biology at UVM. So I started here as an assistant professor and was just promoted. I'm also the director of a graduate training program called Quest. Thank you. Yes, it's awesome. Um, I feel like I can be here and speak having tenure. I shouldn't say that out loud. Okay. <laughs> and and um, the recent recipient of the NSF Career Award. Um, my research is under as an evolutionary biologist looking to understand how organisms adapt to local environmental conditions and how this might affect them in climate change. And um, for graduate education, you'll hear what I have to say about that and as a faculty member shortly. Thank you so much for organizing this and having me. Great to be with you all. Thank you very much. And as well, as well Dr. Linda Dean Shadler. Hi, I'm, I'm, excuse me, I'm Linda Shadler, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering and Mathematical Sciences. I've been at UVM for about two years and uh, love it and very committed to this topic. Thank you for having me. Well, I thank all three of you. At this, this point, point, I'd like to turn our attention to Marie Warsham Banks. Take it away. All righty. First of all, 
I am so excited to be here. I said that, but the first presentation, the fact that he was a mechanical engineering professor, that was like near and dear to my heart. But what he said just was the perfect segue to my presentation. So um, it's not as uh, technical with the stats, but it's really from the heart. And I hope you get some great ideas or feedback. Um, persistence and deliberate pathways for BIPOC and women in STEM. I didn't even know the the uphill climb that we have to go with the the statistics that were just presented. Like, but we have to be persistent and deliberate. I wouldn't be here without that. It has to begin before college. It must be intentional by both faculty and staff. As a a, a woman, a black woman in engineering, I couldn't be afraid of the faculty and staff, and the faculty and staff could not be afraid of me. It can't mirror uh, traditional pathways for traditional students. I couldn't study. I'd never had a study partner in college, never. I studied with the, the TAs and the professors. The traditional uh, pathway is just not the same. So we have to, as a woman, as a black woman, you have to accept that. And as a staff, you need to recognize that. As a, a faculty, you have to recognize that. And something that Dean Linda taught me last year about the imposter syndrome, to recognize and acknowledge that it exists. When you walk in a room as a black woman and you see all white men, and you'll see in my presentation, my graduation picture, sometimes in your mind, you feel like, do I belong here? Am I supposed to be here? And, oh, I'm not ready yet. I got my slides. <laughs> um, but you, you ask the question, you know, Am I supposed to be here? Um, and so you have to recognize that and fight it like a man in the street, like really fight that thought that comes in your head. Then you have to create safe spaces and environments that make it comfortable for us to thrive within the STEM space. Oftentimes when it seems like we don't belong in STEM, we kind of shy away from the space. We, we, we don't, and sometimes when you're not in the place, you miss the opportunity. So those things you have to, as a woman, as a, a, a black woman, you have to really um, get in those spaces. So I just want to talk about my deliberate path real quick. I said it has to begin before college. And the president just spoke earlier. He said, you know, in elementary school, well, this program right here, that set, it's called the Detroit Area Pre-College Engineering Program. It still exists to to this day, but it taught me that it was okay. I don't know why it's uh, changing, but it taught me that it's okay to be an engineer. Everybody in that program looked like me. This little picture right here is about 30 little brown boys and girls that we all were at the Univer Michigan State University as 10th graders for six weeks studying calculus and uh, chemistry, things that we never even thought that we would ever use in the future. Little did we know, a lot of us, there's some professors in this picture, there's some engineers in this picture. But another deliberate path that came to me right after my 10th grade year is this man here called Rodney Patterson. He was the director of multicultural affairs. And Dr. Wanda Grant knows him. He was the director of multicultural affairs and there was a program called RAP. And as you know, these kids in this picture right here, and uh, the, 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 the president talked about the financial need, they probably couldn't afford to spend two summers learning without money. And RAP was a research apprenticeship program that was a deliberate path for students of color to come to University of Vermont, and they got paid to do research. I got paid $300 a week for six weeks. I was rich in 1990, you have no idea. And then, because he was deliberate and intentional about trying to get these numbers, he called me several times because I left there this, that summer thinking I was never coming back. He called me several times, and I finally came. Of course, I did get some financial aid. I did get some scholarship money that made the incentive for me to be able to come to college because I also had a sister at Michigan State. So that helped as well. I included probably 50% of the black population on campus in the picture right there. So because I wasn't connected to the engineering department, 
um, I had a sister in engineering and or in STEM, and I knew about uh, internships. To your far right over at the screen, you'll see an acronym called NOBASHI. Probably never heard of it. It's the National Organization of Black Chemists and Chemical Engineers. That was the organization my sister was in. I'm like, well, I'm not going to be a chemist. And so I found Nesby. And Nesby's on the campus here at University of Vermont. And I was involved in Nesby, and they told me, you got to get summer internships. you got to get summer internships. Not one professor ever told me that. Never heard of it. But God just intervened, and I had two summers at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and that was another de deliberate pathway, and I worked in the engineering mechanics lab there. Then the Office of Multicultural Affairs, I actually heard about a program at the University of New Hampshire, which was a deliberate program to get people of color into graduate research. I did the Ronald McNair Scholars Program. My last summer before I graduated, I did another internship at BASF. Then I come down here and you see graduation. Picture's kind of small, but you can see all the white guys in the picture. Nothing wrong with them. They all were probably great, but I have a little yellow arrow right there so you can see a little brown face. I was short and brown, so I kind of blended in a little bit. But I made it. Career Development Office at University of Vermont was great. I got my first job out of college, and I made it. And you know what? Throughout every path here, I had the imposter syndrome. I struggled, and I had to ask myself, do I belong here? And every day, I had to tell myself I did. And I also, when uh, it was presented in the earlier presentation, it said, why black? leave the STEM fields, sometimes we're asked to by the very people that are teaching us. And that happened to me. And had I not been in these programs where I knew there were other black engineers, I probably would have said, mm, my grades aren't the best. It's probably not for me. And when it was asked me to change my major to business, I said, I don't know anything about business. All I know is engineering. And that's what I'm going to say. And so I stayed. So then after I started working at Verizon, I went to graduate school. I did a stint in management. At, I got a management certificate at the Extension School in Harvard. And then I went and got my master's um, in technology management at Stevens Institute of Technology. So when we talk about my experience as an engineer in college, and then now it's 1996, I'm in corporate America. And how do we get engaged? I'm still the imposter in the room because I'm the only black person in this entire engineering office. I had to be deliberate and persistent. There were maybe three women. They were all significantly older than me. I had to be persistent. I had to go get my graduate degree. I had to go and just work hard, work extra hours. Um, and again, acknowledge that sometimes when people are like, what are you doing here? I had to acknowledge that imposter syndrome and do everything I could to fight it. That comes and tells and belonging to professional organizations. Women, uh, BIPOC population, if you're in STEM, you can't do this alone. Um, mentor and sponsor, there's a difference. A mentor can tell you how to get a job, a sponsor can give you a job. So find your mentor, find your sponsor. In corporate America, you gotta have both all the time. And then when you get in position to be a sponsor, be that. Um, and create opportunities specifically for underrepresented communities in STEM. It's funny uh, that the, the presentation before talked about those schools that really deliberately, you know, spoke to uh, students of color in the STEM fields. Well, uh, last year, Verizon targeted deliberate pathway again. HBCUs to find talent. Just, it's so funny, we do this today. Just last week, I don't know if anyone heard that Wells Fargo CEO said, I'm not complaining, but it's really just tough to find black talent. I, I just can't find it. I'm happy to work for a company um, that went to HBCUs and, and targeted them. And we interviewed several I'm proud to say a lot of them are now working for Verizon. Cream of the crop, programming in Python, programming in Tableau, just killing the game in engineering and IT, and their top talent. Um, at the
University of Vermont, I was there last year. I met several students. I know these students are bright. We have to not treat them like a traditional student. We have to be very intentional by making sure no one walks out of that door without an internship, without research. Pull them out of these jobs that are not in, in uh, STEM fields to really grab them and tell them because that's what happened to me. They, they, I was really surrounded by people who wanted me to win and knew I didn't know, knew my parents didn't know. So it's really good that, um, that the, the population of the BIPOC population in engineering is, is, is growing at the University of Vermont. And we're going to continue to work together um, to just get them out and be successful and to not change their major and to graduate, but also be successful. Thank you. So much, Marie. Um, you know what, before we move on, I just have to say you are not an imposter. And um, I want you to think a little bit more about this sponsorship because it is something that's so important, <laughs> especially for women and people of color to move from being overly mentored and to getting sponsored. So now having said that, we're going to move to Dr. Melissa, if I may, and <laughs> um, Pini. Um, and so um, you're up next, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you, Marie. That was so powerful. Thank you for sharing about your path and your truths. It's insightful for all of us. I feel like my talk is going to fall in between Suresh's and yours, so I'm, I'm happy to be here in terms of personal experience and, and data. So um, I, um, I had prepared a talk that was rich with the data that kind of demonstrates the depressing extent of racism and sexism in, in STEM, and I think perhaps Suresh touched on that a bit. But I reconsidered hearing Wanda's bold charge in this series to give actionable suggestions and to speak from our truths. So I'll share some action items based on my two hats, one as a recently tenured professor and another as a director of a graduate training program called Quest that focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM. So to start, I am retraining myself as a scientist to accept that it is a fallacy that science is objective, immune to the diseases of racism and STEM. And it is a fallacy that one's personal identities have no bearing on their work as a scientist. This realization has come to me in part through interdisciplinary work with a social scientist, Dr. Vijay Kanagala, former UVM faculty member of color, um, here at UVM in our work together on the Quest leadership team. One's identities, whether they're privileged or marginalized, contribute to one's perspective on a problem, even as a scientist or on the road to becoming a scientist. So I'll acknowledge some of my identities. I'm a woman in STEM. I'm a teacher, a mentor, a PI on millions of dollars of external funding. I'm a mother of two and a partner. I'm Mexican-American, and here I'll name that being racially ambiguous in appearance and in name means that I've had likely the privilege of being spared a lot of the systemic biases and racism that my fellow faculty of color have experienced in grant and paper reviews and teaching evaluations and microaggressions. I'm also the first in my family to go to college and from a family that was so low income that I didn't realize how far up we were looking to see the poverty line until filling out the FAFSA to go to college. And whether I'm cognizant of them or not, all of my identities shape how I approach my research, teaching and mentoring. And I find that the more that I accept and reflect on how my lived experiences shape my perspectives, the more inclusive, compassionate and effective I can be as a teacher, mentor, and as a scientist. So in lieu of slide after slide of depressing data, I'll just summarize with this slide, <clears throat> that BIPOC folks and women choose to leave STEM fields at various points in their careers, either switching majors, choosing not to apply to graduate school, being overlooked or excluded in the admissions process for graduate school, or getting their PhD and choosing to pursue, to not pursue an academic career, or getting overlooked on the job market, or starting as a faculty member and then leaving due to the toxic culture. All of these things are true and happening at UVM as a second truth. And studies show that the cause is culture and STEM in academia, not for lack of aptitude or lack of determination. So before I get into how to change the culture, I'll briefly address why. 
And I'll draw from the author and historian, Dr. Ibram Kendi's writing to say that if we need more motivation, then it's just the right thing to do. We can be motivated by the fact that doing anti-racist work is in intelligent self-interest. In the case of STEM, study after study in a wide range of fields and sectors of society have shown that diversity results in better, more impactful, and more innovative science. So we have to ask ourselves, what cures, what inventions, what perspectives are we missing now because of centuries of exclusion and racism, like Wanda started us out with? So in our work in this Quest graduate training program, we're trying to change the culture and tone of STEM. QUEST stands for Quantitative and Evolutionary STEM Training, and it's an interdisciplinary PhD pr program here at UVM involving eight academic units across campus. It's presently funded by the National Science Foundation, but hopefully eventually will become a part of, the, of UVM's support system. And the program is unique as a STEM traineeship for two major reasons. We put diversity, equity, and inclusion work at the core of our programming activities, and we facilitate and require applied internships with non-academic partners. The broad research collective goal is to use big data, data science, and principles of ecology and evolution to better understand and solve global and environmental health challenges. So to change the culture in STEM, we are using asset, an asset-based framework for recruitment and retention that acknowledges that students are valued and expected to succeed and that their lived experiences, their grit, their passion will contribute to their success as a scientist or STEM professional. And honestly, I think this is revolutionary, like what Marie spoke to, particularly as a tool to dismantle imposter syndrome, the feeling of not belonging. So we do this by considering all parts of their application to get a sense of their person, their lived experiences, their passion, their ambition. And we don't consider scores like the GRE or GPA that are known to be biased against people of color. And we make a brief accessible application knowing that paperwork and bureaucracy are indeed exclusionary. Second, we also acknowledge the contributions of identities, race, class, nationality, gender, sex, religion, ability or disability, and neurodiversity. And we acknowledge that the intersectionality of these identities is what creates lived experiences that shape us. For example, a black woman in STEM doesn't experience the culture of the academe as, the, as only a black person or as only a woman in STEM. They experience this as, the, as a black woman in STEM with the double bind of race and gender that oppresses freedom and to pursue personal and professional success. So if we, anyone with power is what I mean by we, power or privilege, can work to make space for the deepest of intersectional identities, this world will be a better place. So whether privileged or marginalized, these identities shape the paths and perspectives of an individual. For example, teachers that encouraged or discouraged particular subjects or career pathways. I'm, I'm inspired by Marie's story and, and also recall and liken it to that of Neil deGrasse Tyson's examples of how many times in his life as a black man, he had to beat off the suggestions to pursue athletics rather than his extreme passion for astrophysics. And to think if he had done that, if he had listened to any one of those times, it, we, what a loss for the rest of us. Now he's the most famous astrophysicist in America and perhaps even the world making complex concepts accessible to the rest of us. So third, I'll say be uncomfortable. I'm reminded of a quote by P.T. Barnum that comfort is the enemy of progress. We all have to make ourselves uncomfortable in grappling with the systems and the people that have led to either our privileged or our marginalized positions in academia and or to honor the roots and the grit that got us here to be able to pave the way for the next generation of STEM scholars and leaders. And as a student in my graduate seminar last week brilliantly said in our discussion, as a white woman, racism is really difficult and uncomfortable for me to talk about, but it's necessary because it's worse to experience racism. And I love that they put it in this perspective of the alternative. Either be comfortable and be uncomfortable and make others uncomfortable or perpetuate racism. That comment also acknowledges that race and racism is not a BIPOC issue. 
that, but rather the burden of anyone with power and privilege to work to dismantle. So we acknowledge in this program that this work doesn't require guilt. It just requires self-reflection, compassion to yourself and to others, and action. And fourth, we build community. So when you do this work, you do this hard work, when you share about your identities and your lived experiences, a side product is that you build community, or maybe that's an intentional product, through building trust and a support network, which increases success, belonging, mental health, and retention. And we also organize social events and support the development of interest group networks, which are support networks by and for the students for professional development. And I also want to give out, give a shout out to the newly developed, um, sorry, one slide back, um, to the newly um, started uh, UVM SACNAS chapter, Society for Advancement of Chicanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans in Science. It's an inclusive group that supports the success, professional development, and career advancement of marginalized groups in STEM. Check it out, get involved, it's, it's inclusive, so. All right, so I'll start with, now I'll switch my hat and put on my faculty member hat and present one angle of the problem for BIPOC faculty at UVM. So BIPOC folks, as Suresh um, pointed to, make up about 40% of the US population and about 41% of the US STEM PhDs. And this would seem great, but unfortunately there's a dramatic underrepresentation of black and Hispanic folks, and particularly black and Hispanic women. What seems like even representation is driven by overrepresentation of Asian Americans in STEM. Asian Americans make up about 5% of the US population and about 25% of the US STEM PhDs. Um, however, including Asian folks again, because that's how we've aggregated the data at UVM, BIPOC folks across the US make up about 25% of STEM PhD, or I'm sorry, of 25% um, of the faculty at all ranks and all disciplines at US institutions. And Looking at the same statistic at UF UVM, we're at 12.7% in 2015, and we're still at 12.7% in, in 2019. Um, so we're at half the national average with no change over the last five years. And then if you focus on Black, Hispanic, or multiracial identities, we're at half that, 12.5%. And if you focus on Black, Hispanic, multiracial in STEM, cut that down again by 75%. Now, if you want to see Black, Hispanic, multiracial racial in STEM and a woman, you wouldn't even see the line on this chart. So um, I'll just say that this is in part due to a lack of retention. Since I've been here, 15 faculty members of color have left, several of whom I con considered close colleagues. And to me, honestly, it's felt like the place to leave rather than the place to be. So I'll share with you four suggestions now that um, were developed by the faculty of color here at UVM and presented to the president, provost, faculty, senate, board of trustees, and council of deans. First, support and fund the faculty of color group that exists on campus. One champion among this group has spent her time drumming up money every year to host professional development and community building events. Thank you, Ginny Hugh. And these events and this community are priceless to retention and recruitment of faculty of color. I recall an early conversation with Bev Colston in which she said, in which she said retention is recruitment, which I interpreted twofold. One, you can't build community unless you have community. And two, cherish the assets you have. Retain your current faculty. It's a lot easier and cheaper than replacing faculty. Similarly, I remember an early conversation with Yolanda Chen. I think we were literally talking about finding a house and she said, come for the home, stay for the community. But I think there's a larger metaphor there. Come for the institution or the job and stay for the community. So please don't make Ginny or any of us continue to spend our time pleading for small amounts of money that make a big impact. Make the institutional commitment, fund and champion the organization. Second, support the career advancement of BIPOC faculty. Acknowledge and value the additional service and mentoring demands that BIPOC and women faculty take on. For example, there's no place in my annual activity reports or my CV for the number of students that have cried in my office this year or last year. Not that I, I, I value doing that and being able to support folks, but I'm sure it happens to me a lot more than to my white male colleagues. 
and include DEI work as a part of everybody's promotion and tenure consideration in annual activity reports. This would give everyone the time and motivation to engage with this, this essential but challenging work. And what better message to demonstrate to the, that an institution values this work and, it, and, and expects it of its non-BIPOC faculty. And take to take teaching evaluations at face value for consideration and promotion, tenure, and merit-based pay increase, while these have been shown to be biased against women and faculty of color again and again, is to perpetuate institutional racism and sexism. And mentoring groups. I've been fortunate enough to be involved in two such groups, one that my former chair and, and president and present provost of faculty affairs, Jim Vigoro, connected me with. Um, out of U UMass Amherst, uh, six female faculty of color in STEM across Northeast institutions. And these people have been invaluable to my success. Um, group mentoring for faculty of color and women, or perhaps anyone, is much more effective than one-on-one -on -one hierarchical mentoring. You get a diversity of perspectives on any challenge, and you don't all need to get along, unlike one-on-one -on -one relationships. So up the recruitment, fourth, up the recruitment, or third, and, and higher, uh, do cluster hires. And this has been shown to be effective for increasing recruitment and retention of faculty of color. And these faculty should be su supported with larger startup packages to compensate for the additional service and work that me and the mentoring that they'll do and the demonstrated systemic bias in federal funding agencies. Lastly, develop a cross-college, university-wide funded program with an articulated process for evaluating and making partner hires quickly. Studies on, based on surveys have shown that academics of color and women academics are more likely to be partnered with another academic compared to non-BIPOC and male academics. In addition, academics of color and women are more, more highly prioritized the job satisfaction of their partners compared to non-BIPOC and male academics. So these two facts mean that if you want to recruit and retain faculty of color, you must make a genuine and quick effort to hire their academic partners. In addition, dual hires help with retention as two people grow, grow roots in a place and become invested and committed to a community and institution. And as a success story, my partner and I were part of a dual hire when there was originally just one search and one position, but the former Dean Antonio Cepeda Benito made the dual hire happen. Otherwise, we wouldn't have come here. And now we both have tenure, both received the prestigious NSF Career Awards, and we are both PIs on over $15 million in extramural funding. And we have a built-in mentoring group of two, for better or for worse. So lastly, I just wanna hope that you've come away with concrete suggestions for how our institution can become more anti-racist and supportive of women and BIPOC folks in STEM. And these last four suggestions that I've given you are big ones. Um, that, that requires support and pressure from all levels. Students, faculty, and staff can tell their chairs, deans, provosts, VPs, and the president that they support these actions. But there's a number of other things that you can do, like creating an inclusive learning environment in your classroom. So many of the workshops that I've done at the Center for Teaching and Learning have really helped me look at my syllabus and think about how I interact with and support students of color, first-gen students, in a much more meaningful way. And in your STEM classes, start working to dismantle the idea that science is wholly objective. Talk about how racism, sexism, and colonialism has, has and continues to impact and lead to failures, flaws, and inequities in your scientific discipline. I teach genetics, so it's ripe with examples, eugenics, biological determinism as a justification for racism, James Watson, Rosalind Franklin, Henrietta Lacks, so reflect also on your teaching and mentoring and recruiting. Are you imposing your own biases in these processes? And then keep up with your, your DEI hygiene. This is not a one and done. It's a process, it's a practice, particularly when we're surrounded by institutional racism and sexism. So challenge yourself frequently and work with professionals. It's hard to do this if you're trained as a scientist. And have discussions with your, with your department and your lab group. So with that, thank you for letting me share my piece and thank you for your time. And I look forward to continuing these discussions. Thank you, Melissa. Oh my God, that was so rich. I mean, you have just filled my tool bag, but here's the thing about tool bags and toolkits, right? 
they can be overflowing. But if I don't know how, if I don't know how to apply those tools, they just sit there unused. So I really, really hope that people were really listening about how not only what you should have in your tool box or your kit or your bag, but also how to begin to imp um, implement them, apply them to the situation. But I can't wait till we get to some Q&A. So at this time, I also like to invite Dean Chandler. Um, what are we gonna do um, as administrators? I'm so glad you're here. What do you have to say? Thank you, Wanda. And um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about what administrators can do, but also about the value of making sure that we have a diverse population in, in the STEM fields. Um, I just wanted to first, though, make sure you understood my background a little bit, because I think my perspective has been strongly influenced by that. And um, my pathway has been easier than some because of it and, and harder than some um, because of it. So in the lower left there, you're seeing a General Electric and Union College. Uh, my father was the chief metallurgist for General Electric Company, and my mother got her PhD when I was in elementary school and was a professor at Union College. So there was really never any question that I was going to be in a STEM field. Um, it was just part of the family, and that's the way it worked. <laughs> Um, at the same time, however, you can see on the lower right, I'm, I'm married with two kids and they are both in STEM fields, so that tradition's continuing. But at the same time, my oldest sister that you're seeing on the very far right was born first, five years ahead of me, and um, experienced significant brain injury during birth, such that they thought she would never walk or talk or anything. And so my mother was also extremely focused on the success of my sister who is graduated from high school, has a job, um, even learned to drive a car for a while. So it's a huge success story, but at the same time, it was an example for me of advocacy. Uh, my mother spent many, many hours advocating for mainstreaming of children with disabilities into the school systems and um, also taught us a value of, of um, that everybody has a contribution to make. I could go into depth about the value of having a sister like that in a family, but um, th that's the point, that you just learned to value everybody. Um, but I was in a very sheltered and very privileged intellectual environment. Um, I went to Cornell. When I left undergraduate and went to Penn is when all of a sudden it hit me that I was doing something really unusual. Um, being a woman in a PhD program in engineering was very challenging. Um, but fortunately, I had the family in the background that I could call who um, supported me. Um, even though my father was first generation, um, he had been to college, so that was a huge help. But when I got to Drexel, I was the first woman in my department, and at Rensselaer, I was the first woman in my department and the first full professor and a bunch of things like that. And I believe I'm the first woman dean of engineering at the University of Vermont. So I, wa I guess I just want to point out that I came from a pathway that made it really easy in many ways, but I also had things along the way that made me appreciate the challenges, particularly of people of color in STEM, but also women. Um, I wanted to get a little bit more specific about the value added of having diversity in STEM. I don't know how many of you remember this story or have, or have read this story, but Ford made a, a mint off their Windstar minivan. And they did because they had women engineers on their design team so that the, the, the minivan had all the features that a soccer mom needed in order to be successful with her career and her kids and the soccer, on the soccer team. And it, it was that perspective of women that completely changed the in, specifically internal design of that car for success. And that's maybe kind of a mundane example, but I just think it's such a, a clear example of that value. Um, I don't know how many of you have read, uh, watched Hidden Figures. I, I've watched it three or four times. I, I love some of the scenes in that movie where you watch the awakening of some of the white males in particular um, in, at NASA. Um, but, you know, we probably would not have gone to the moon as quickly as we did without this particular woman's contribution, Katherine Johnson, um, for, for being able to calculate the tra trajectories of the Apollo um, rockets. and, and uh, uh, and space vehicles. Um, and that, but there's many other stories there about the success of the Apollo program because of the contributions of many different people and NASA became more and more open to that as those programs um, developed. 
And finally, I just read recently uh, Melinda Gates' book. That's her picture of her holding her book. And she, she told a fantastic story of um, organizations coming into a developing country and trying to help and wanting to develop a seed that would be more appropriate for uh, growth in that area. And they talked to the men. And they developed a seed, spending, spending millions of dollars, not the Gates Foundation, they learned from this mistake, millions of dollars on the development of a seed that they then brought to the village and the women wouldn't use it because they were the ones in the fields and they needed something that, that had very different properties than what the men thought that the crop needed, which was just you know, productivity. And so it's, it's just a beautiful example, and there are many beautiful examples in her book of how talking to the right people leads to the right solutions for the right communities. Um, so I, I urge you to sort of look for these stories because they're not typically the ones we celebrate, and they're so critical and, and exactly what we need to learn from to make sure that as we approach the grand challenges of, of the planet right now, that we do it in a way that, that serves everyone in the planet and not just some people on the planet. And I don't have, you know, super insight, Wanda, I'm sorry, into the role of administrators. I don't know that there's a step change thing that needs to happen here. I think administrators need to be informed of the best practices in hiring. One of the changes we made in SEMS was that. And if I were to show you of a picture of who was hired five years ago and who was hired last year, you would see a huge difference. And we didn't change the quality. We didn't change anything but using a rubric that made the search committees think about the professional qualities of the person as opposed to how they felt about the person. And, um, and then it's, you know, diversification is, is happening in my faculty slowly. Um, and making sure those, those priorities are clear to not only to search committees, but, you know, to all the organizations in your college where you have to walk the talk and invest in the talk, spend, um, typically it's gift dollars, but, but on the programs that will support uh, the, the activities that are happening. For example, um, the Nesby chapter is brand new in SEMS. We've invested thousands of dollars in supporting them to get started in their pathway. Um, and also in, in, in letting faculty go to workshops, uh, helping support faculty going to workshops for training staff as well. Uh, to make sure mentoring programs in place, and this is a place where SEMS is not yet there. I'm about to announce a, a mentoring program for my junior faculty, but um, we are working on mentoring programs for the students as well. Um, to provide venues for discussion. So uh, in SEMS, we're putting workshops together. I think UVM does this really well, but not every place I worked um, provided those venues. Um, maybe not really well, but better than the places I've been, where people can find places to, to talk about the important issues around uh, diversifying the workforce. And then to be open to new policies, new approaches, and new pr uh, procedures that would encourage inclusion and work towards equity. I think, you know, it's so easy to just keep the same things in place. So my um, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee is working on looking at our policies and procedures to see what we might be able to change to, to help facilitate success of everyone in the college. Um, and you know, I'm a huge believer in this concept because every time I've taken something I really love, a, a plan I want to implement, a curriculum I love, and I, I take it to more people, and I, at first I get really frustrated because they're changing it and criticizing it, but every time when it comes back, it's better. And the more broadly that it's been vetted, the better it comes back. So personally, I've also lived this. And uh, so I, I, I applaud Melissa this concept, get into places where you're uncomfortable, take the criticism, learn from it, and, and don't take it personally um, as we're trying to figure this out because I don't think there are just easy answers to all of it, Wanda, sorry. <laughs> I think if it was easy, we'd be there already. So that's it for me. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I so appreciate it. Oh, my God. I feel like, I know I keep saying, oh, my God. But what rich information has come forth here? I, I'm going to kick us off, and I really, you know, I heard a lot of stuff here. I heard, you know, invest in the talk. I heard things like, you know, um, mentorship and sponsorship. I heard things like the imposter syndrome. I heard um, things like um, in relationship to intersectionality and, um, you know, how we show up. I don't experience racism one day and then sexism the next day. 
and what all of that means and how much culture and climate. And I listen to all of that and I think about President Garamella's original sort of um, um, question and comments, um, but question in terms of his um, op-ed piece. You can really see clearly how we are missing the millions. And so, um, and I think there's some really good answers and so forth. I'd like maybe if a couple of you might just kind of take me back a little bit around um, what stands out to me as a woman, a woman of color, and very specifically black African American. Um, um, maybe I'll start with um, Melissa. If you can say a little bit more about the culture and climate, and um, and then I, I, I love to hear a little bit from um, Marie around this idea around you know being an imposter and. I think about the year that you graduated and wanting to ask the question, do we feel like as administrators, as um, professors, as um, individuals who are practitioners doing the work, that our, our folks are graduating out of undergraduate, graduate school, coming into, the, into their settings, feeling like still that they don't belong there and that they're somehow uh, um, not authentic. So the first question is a little bit more about culture and climate. And, um, and its impact. And then the second part is, you know, what, you know, are, are folks still showing up in the workplace or in the classrooms as really feeling like they don't belong and they didn't, that, that um, they don't belong? And um, um, how do we get beyond that? That's huge. Um, I think, I think it's hard um, because when, when you do have these intersectional identities and you are, you know, unique in a room, when you walk into a room, you can automatically feel like you're in the spotlight. The, it's, it's on you to mess up and everybody's watching. Um, so I think that how we change that culture is um, to, um, to make everybody else uncomfortable, frankly, <laughs> to, you know, to, or to challenge that it's okay and normal to, to, for, for example, be white and male in STEM. So is that okay? Is that normal? No, you know, it does, it's, it's not. Um, so I think that the more that we can um, challenge the assumptions that, uh, and accept that, you know, people are coming into spaces with different levels of comfort and even that comfort level out, I think the more we can shift the culture to be more inclusive. Um, I think then it also happens in very practical ways about expectations and communicating expectations either at the grad school level or as, at the undergrad level in your, in your syllabi. Um, that kind of either create a culture of flexibility, let's saying, you know, I know things might come up for you. You can come talk to me. Um, so being understanding and receptive to, to the different situations that people might be experiencing would be another way to change the culture and not assume that everybody has an experience of the, of the majority. Just a quick follow-up, Melissa, if I may. I mean, you said some powerful things around, um, uh, around racism and sexism. Um, and um, as you know, that one of my goals here was really to really think about, um, you know, systemic and um, racism or systemic, you know, sexism and other forms of oppression. Um, and basically the things that happen over and over again and, um, and those things that are through our systems. I mean, do you think that um, we're getting better as I don't just mean as a university, as University of Vermont, but I mean in terms of as well as higher education and in corporate and business. Are we getting better at at least acknowledging that those things exist, or no? We're still in your mind and these different industries. Are we still just so far away from that? I think it really depends on whether or not people have honestly reflected and grappled with their privilege. Um, is one and two the leaders like do do the leaders value having people engage with this material I I told myself I would resist bringing up the debate but to hear you know last night that um, you know the DEI work that was happening in the White House House was just canceled because 
people didn't want to be uncomfortable and that it, you know, there was an, a notion that it was reverse racism. No, in some spaces when there are leaders that are suggesting that, then, then we're not moving forward. So it really depends on, on the perspective of the leaders and the, the value that they, um, that they encourage. Um, and then I guess for the, the people, you know, saying that this is what I value and I'm going to make myself uncomfortable and I'm going to spend the time to do this rather than running another analysis or doing another experiment or studying for this test. Um, yeah, thank you for the challenge. I'm going to follow back up with uh, Marie, and then we're going to go to our audience. Um, uh, Marie, this imposter syndrome. Well, and, and you know, uh, as long as the environment is not inclusive, you will always question, I challenge any white guy to go to an HBCU homecoming and not feel like he's an imposter at this event. And as long as you go into a corporate setting and you're still not only a, a, a minority because you're black, because you're a woman, um, Sometimes you still feel that, uh, and 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 I work very hard to fight that. And I and as a 47 year old woman, I'm I'm comfortable with who I am. I'm very grounded in who I am, but I still get passed over for promotion. I still have opportunities that are not even communicated to me. Um, but I never question whether or not I belong there, but I don't ever give uh, the impression that there, that it's still, it's okay. It, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, Verizon is a, is a great company. And this year with our, our CEO going through the whole uh, injustices that have been in the forefront in our country, the courageous conversations are starting. And core, I'm like flabbergasted, but they are starting. But I've been told by a boss that, you know, it's harder for white men because to get jobs here because I have to interview X amount of people of color just to get my slate filled. I've been told that. And so when that happens, it's so funny when the, uh, when the president talked about the number of how many women need to be hired, how many black people need to be hired, how many uh, Latinx people need to be hired to just get representative of the demographic. Most people, most white people would challenge that if we ever went on an initiative to close that gap, that we were reverse discriminating. Mm. That, that would be your, that, that we're reverse discriminating. And so, when you have that culture, um, you have that, because most people in Verizon, really, they don't even know what an HBCU is. They don't even know they exist. And so to even go to an HBCU as a recruiter, someone in there had to set that up, because I'm sure they didn't even know that they had some of the most stellar engineering programs in the country, and they produce a lot of black PhDs in engineering. Um, so yeah, you you have to emotionally fight that um, that feeling, and you have to be proud of your accomplishments that you made it through, that you didn't quit, that you didn't um, turn away from it. So it it's a struggle every day. Uh, again, when I met the the the, the women, a uh, student of color in, in engineering, they struggled with it. The male students of color, they all struggle with it, and to the point that they wouldn't even even consider jobs in their field. And so it they may not talk about it as an imposter syndrome, but it's there. It's present in their actions and how they move as engineering students. So we the fight continues. Well, you know, thank you. And um, you know, I, I'm gonna do a follow up question with you that's here in the chat and then I, I, I I'm I'm gonna prepare um, Linda, that I'm, I'm coming that way as I, I think about some of the things that um, I know that we're doing here that are, uh, that are really 
uh, I really certainly believe are very positive. And when I listen to sort of the, the program that Melissa has going on, and I want to get over there, but I want to follow up in terms of, there's a question here for you, Marie. Um, as a BIPOC professional in corporate America, what lessons could institutions of higher education glean from companies like Verizon? I think that you started sort of articulating that in, in your presentation and so forth. Can you just say a little bit more about that? Well, okay. So one thing that the first organization um, that I joined in from, uh, Verizon, there, there was an organization for black employees. And at uh, University of Vermont, certainly there was a, a black student union. Um, but I think institutionally, we really, uh, well, at Verizon, they did have black managers workshops. They had programs and organizations in place to, to mentor you. Certainly systemic racism existed in the hiring practices. It's just, there's no way of getting around it. Um, but I see right now the deliberate pathway, like if, if, if the institution is really um, committed to increasing their BIPOC population in STEM, they need to start in the middle schools in that area. They need to be hosting programs. All those kids need to be at your campus all the time. I was at Wayne State University, Michigan State. I was at every corporation in the city of Detroit taking just classes and not necessarily learning anything, but just familiarizing. Like when I heard inorganic chemistry in college, it didn't, it didn't make me go crazy because I had taken a class as a freshman, probably to learn absolutely nothing, but the language didn't intimidate me. So, so where Verizon um, as a corporation is starting to make those pathways with HBCUs and making those connections, institutions need to make those deliberate pathways well before high school and middle school. Partner with the schools in your community and be deliberate about students um, in the BIPOC population. You have to. And if you, your traditional pathways that are in place are not going to necessarily work the same way. So I think as a, um, a woman in corporate America, I have to surround myself by mentors inside and outside the organization. I'm constantly learning, getting on webinars, learning from different mentors, reading, um, just networking and staying connected and staying current. You still also have to be smart, <laughs> vibrant, and in touch with the technology as well. So, but as from an institution perspective, start before college to get them there. And then the programs that existed 20 years ago, you got to pay these students. There's a whole bunch of students on campus right now that need money and they work because they need money and they need to be working in engineering. They got to find a pathway to get them internships and research that pay money so they can survive and learn and be great. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Dean Chandler, I, I have to tell the story, a couple quick, quick stories. The first one, one of the reasons that Marie is here is because um, you had the insight that you really wanted to reach back out and that you wanted to get going in terms of building capacity um, and programs and efforts as it related to BIPOC people, as it related to women. And, but very specifically, followed up on connecting with um, Marie as one of our graduates. And actually, I don't know if it was said, um, but our first woman of color graduate um, out of the program. And so you went out there. The second thing is that I wanted to say is that one of the reasons I wanted to do this that stood out is that I had the pleasure, I don't know, maybe eight, nine months ago, maybe I'm bad with timing, that I heard you speak at Global Foundries um, at their International Women's Day. I was invited as a guest to be there and be, um, and um, you, then you found out, I, you know, you saw me, we waved, and your story and what you told. And so there's clearly uh, a commitment, um, you know, President Garamella writing the op-ed piece, there's clearly a commitment 
Um, and so what I'd like to just um, put out there and ask, can you just talk about um, the piece in terms of what we, we myself, myself, have to begin to begin do or continue to do? Because we can't sort of wait for it to come to us. We actually have to go out there and um, make these things happen. And it starts to get into what Melissa, um, you know, Dr. Pimpensi was sp speaking about, getting out there and being active. So my last question, um, as we're kind of sort of coming to the hour, is really about, can you just share some more thoughts about um, the process that you've gone through, and I'm sure President Garamella has gone through, to really think about how we begin to get, um, how we begin to tap into those missing millions um, and so that we can begin to make a difference and be innovative and create solutions for our world around some of these ills in society. Um, we got to be able to make a difference here and there are some people left on the table. There's talent left on the table. So share some, share some thoughts. thoughts. Yeah, so I guess I, I agree with Marie. I've been working to do K-12 through outreach for my entire career. Um, Look up molecularium.com and you'll see, or molecularium.org, and you'll see one of those examples. Um, I ran a, a summer program that brought in uh, students that we focused on coming from HBCUs and all women's colleges into engineering for 10 years. Um, so that was providing research experiences once you were in college. Um, but at UVM, we, um, I've been really been focused on supporting FIRST Robotics because I also believe that we don't have enough voice from rural Vermonters at UVM and in engineering overall. Um, so we've, this year, not through my efforts, but efforts of folks in my college, they've doubled the number of FIRST Robotics teams in the state. Those are so critical for capturing students into STEM. Um, we're working with Winooski High School to try to get them up to speed in their robotics program. We have um, set up dual enrollment with uh, Burlington High School, and of course those are the two most diverse high schools in the state, um, to try and encourage students to take CAD and, and uh, machining, machine, the machine shop course as sort of an entree into engineering. So I guess I'm just, wherever there are opportunities that pop up, I'm encouraging either through investment or allowing folks the time to do it or um, contributing myself to uh, develop as many of those fingers uh, as you can because you never know which one is going to be the one that ends up being the strongest partnership and the most successful. Um, so I think we need to be looking everywhere. <laughs> um, and I'll, I will also mention that we are, I am in search of significant funding um, both from alumni and from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute to bring in a cohort of students into STEM students of color into STEM, where we would more specifically bridge the Mosaic Center's efforts, the student affairs efforts, and the academic efforts to be a very consistent and holistic support of students for, through all four years of the program, in, including financial support. Um, and I'm really hopeful that one of those um, is going to end up allowing us to really launch that program. And I think once we see the success of that, that the support will just will just flow in for that. So I don't know if that's what you were looking for, but a few thoughts. And maybe one follow up piece of quite part of this question is, um, you know, we talked about and used the word BIPOC a lot and so forth. One of the things that is dear to me, um, might you share any specific thoughts very specifically looking at black and brown folk, as we like to say, in terms of really looking at that population? Um, to to inspire and encourage to come through the door. Yeah, so um, certainly that's part of the goal of reaching out to Winooski High School for a robotics program. I think when students get caught up into that, that they um, are in, into the first robotics, they get sucked into STEM in a really great way. So that's one specific one. We um, I'm very big fan of Nesby. Um, and so we, we launched the Nesby chapter. I didn't, the students did, uh, right about when I first walked in the door. Um, this HHMI program would be focused on BIPOC population, but, but, but um, students of color, I think, um, even more specifically, and not just women, but all students of color. Um, so is that what you're asking me? Like, I was asking as trying to into, you know, sometimes we collectively talk about BIPOC, black, indigenous, people of color, 
are we talking, you know, women, there, there's, uh, there is absolutely, um, I may have a little bias here, I admit, but there's some absolutely um, some energy and effort of really wanting to look at, you know, black African-American women, men, um, as well as Latinx um, and so forth in these, um, in, in these com in communities around technology, around sciences. And, um, and sometimes, you know, as we said, we have to be very intentional and really target and sometimes um, not be as broad. And so, yes, and how, so how are we tapping into that specific population? That, so, that, so. Yeah, the HHMI program and, and, and the high schools we're reaching out to is part of that, absolutely. Great. Great. I have, I have one question before I turn it back over to Nicole, and this is going to go to Melissa. Um, someone in the chat has asked, perhaps non-traditional STEM students are more inspired and interested in a curriculum providing a welcoming space, solving real world problems in pursuit of a better world. Can you um, respond to that or you have any thoughts about that? It's, it's um, yeah, I think that that's a bit of what we're seeing with the Quest program. I think the name also happens to capture it, but the, the goal, kind of the tagline, is better understanding and solving global and environmental health problems. I think that that's true, but then I think there's also a lot of pressure in BIPOC communities to pursue more, you know, uh, um, I guess, like money making degrees, perhaps like become a doctor or an engineer. So sometimes if you're, if you think about, you know, there's been a lot of talk and amazing uh, work towards supporting BIPOC students and faculty in fields of ecology and evolution, where there's even a stronger underrepresentation. So I kind of, I think that um, the talk yesterday through the Rubenstein, with the Rubenstein School spoke a lot to that about, you know, welcoming and acknowledging the interaction of students from diverse communities with the natural world and making the natural world a better place. Um, but I think it's not just the natural world, you know, there's environmental and health problems too that engineers and doctors need to solve. So I think that there's, um, there's, you know, any sector, any problem can use a more diverse um, perspective on it. Thank you all so mm -hmm. much. I really, um, he's not um, here, but I know he's going to definitely um, be looking at this video and continually to work on many of these issues. So big thank you to President Garamella. We so much appreciate it. Thank you, Dean Shadler. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Melissa Pampunzi. I, um, I really so appreciate it. You have, uh, all of you have just, I think for me, open my eyes even wider, watch out, because I like to say Wanda is ready to roll around these topics and my toolkit is full, overflowing, but I'm going to make sure, along with my colleagues, that we know how to apply them. We just can't have them, but we have to be able to apply them. So thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm going to turn to my colleague, Nicole. Wanda, thank you so much, Melissa, Linda, Suresh, and Marie. The information that you've shared today is so valuable, and we appreciate all of the honesty that you shared. The comments in the chat box were so positive um, for this information, and it is very obvious that it is needed, and we need to continue these conversations. And Wanda, thank you so much for being the vision behind Beyond Brave Spaces. This is the fourth in the series on the website. We'll put that website up in just a moment. You can go back and review the other topics that have also been discussed incredibly important. In addition, um, this is uh, an evolution of events. Um, Wanda started this discussion with Amazing Grace, and from there, she continued the conversation of finding answers and beyond brave spaces. So this will continue because Wanda is on a roll. And we also want to give you an opportunity to learn um, and to share what you've learned today with our digital badge for participation. Um, this wouldn't be a University of Vermont presentation without giving you the opportunity to show what you've learned and share that as well. So there's information on the screen about that digital badge and what that means. You might want to add the badge to your LinkedIn profile, to your social media, to your digital resume, because this 
is a topic that is important to you and you want to showcase that out. There's information again on the screen and we'll share that in the chat box also. Again, expressing our gratitude to Dr. Wanda Heading Grant for the vision to continue these conversations and her team and also the team that is helping to support all of these events. Thank you very much to Kelly, Foster, Eric, Sherwood, Krista Hagen, Howe, Paul, everybody who's behind the scenes. We couldn't do this without you. So how did this go? We would love to hear from you as well. I know that Wanda looks at these evaluations and is really eager to hear about your feedback for the topics, not just today, but all of the sessions that we have been doing. Please note that the evaluation link is in there and Kelly will put that up into the chat box also. And as we mentioned, um, the conversation continues. Please do look um, at the web address there, go.uvm.edu, beyond Brave Spaces, those dashes in between, so that you can keep this conversation going and share this information. As we mentioned in the beginning, this has been recorded. It will be put up on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion website, the YouTube channel, and a link on their website as soon as possible. Thank you again, Wanda. Thank you again to Melissa, to Linda, to Suresh, and to Marie for sharing today and being a part of this important discussion. Have a great afternoon.